welcome to What She Said. I'm your host, Lucy Lucraft, a freelance journalist and blogger from London. Each week, I chat to awesome humans about their journey to where they are today, and we share lots of blogging tips and tricks too. You can hear the entire back catalogue, as well as new episodes wherever you listen to podcasts by searching for my name or searching What She Said, or you can go to my website, wanderloose.com. And if you want to connect with me online, you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Lucy Lucraft. So hello, Fiona. Hi, Lucy. Welcome to the podcast. I was about to say welcome back. And the reason I'm saying that is because you're going to be on the podcast in Series 3 at some point, as yet untitled and undated. Um, This is a bit of a different episode because Fiona is going to be interviewing me. So for long-time listeners of what she said... um, Sam Sparrow interviewed me back in season one, I think it was episode 10, I'll link to it in the show notes, um, but I haven't been, I haven't kind of been on my own podcast to talk about myself since Podmas, um, so I thought it'd be quite nice, and Fiona is a brilliant host and a podcaster herself, um, and I will link to her podcast in the show notes, but I thought she would be the perfect person to interview me, so I'm going to hand it over to you now. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that. I just hope I can. Um, I just hope I can deliver now after that introduction. <laughs> um, but no, I'm really, I'm really excited to uh, to do this. Um, it's going to be really good. Me too. Yeah. So I thought we would start um, by having a bit of a catch up from. So I listened to uh, your episode where Sam Sparrow interviewed you, and I just thought that we would start um, by having a bit of a catch up about where, about how your life has changed since then, and what you've been up to. Yeah, so when Sam and I chatted, it was so early days with the podcast, um, and things were. So, it feels like things were really different. Mm. Um, I guess they were, but it's probably a year ago now, maybe that we chatted. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that my work and my life and my actual physical location has changed a lot in the past year so I've moved from London to Brighton fairly recently and I um, took a bit of time off while we were moving um, and officially went back to work in January um, after a year of maternity leave which um, I basically mostly worked throughout it so yeah, I guess that's kind of what's been happening. And the podcast has probably been um, the one constant throughout the past year is that I've been putting out episodes every week. Um, I took a tiny little break over Christmas, but then I put out Podmas episodes, just little solo episodes. And then, yeah, I guess the biggest change has been in January when I went back to work. I was so I was so nervous to officially go back to work, which is kind of mm-hmm. strange given that I'd never really stopped, but maybe it was because the, I don't know, like being officially going back to work and having no comfort blanket anymore of maternity leave meant that, yeah, I really had to make money. Um, Yeah, you couldn't sort of excuse it. You couldn't sort of say, well, I'm on maternity leave. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's the perfect, yeah, you put that perfectly. Um. Yeah, I think because of that meant that I was just, I don't know, I just felt quite lost as well. I didn't really know, I'd had such a long time out from journalism and I didn't know if I would be able to still, I, you know, I hadn't pitched for such a long time. I'd built up some really good relationships with editors, so I didn't realise how privileged I'd been over the past few years that I was able to, um, I don't know, like fall back on those great relationships um Mm. albeit ones that I had worked hard on building myself but yeah so I didn't really yeah I just didn't really know and also being uh, you know predominantly before I went on maternity leave before I got pregnant I was a I was a travel journalist um and (laughs) traveling with a baby (laughs) (laughs) not that easy (laughs) yeah not that easy at all um so, yeah, it, it was just a big state of flux. It was really, personally, there was a lot going on and um, I didn't, I just didn't know where everything was going to go. And then I thought, oh, you know what, I think I'm going to write a course about SEO because I'm really good at SEO in comparison to everybody that I've spoken to. 
Mm. Um, and I'm really sick of, of seeing bloggers be kind of bamboozled by it and uh, feel like they, I don't know, like it's a big mystery. Well, you know what I'm like. I just, I, I can't bear, I can't bear bullshit. I can't bear like people trying to talk down to other people and make things sound more complex than they are. <laughs> do, you, do you think people do that to sell their services though? Do you yeah. think that they, that like SEOers, if that's even a word, like <laughs> try and keep some sort of mystery around it so that it looks more complicated than it is? Yeah, yeah, I do. And actually, mm. I don't necessarily think the proper SEO geeks, like the Neil Patels or whatever of the world, I don't necessarily think that they are the ones... Uh, trying to make it sound more complex than it is I think it's often it's uh, people who want to sell a blogging course or you know whatever Mm. yeah I think you're right I think and also I think there's probably a bit of it makes if you've if you've mastered it yourself through by hook or by crook and you've gone through all the trials and tribulations of being a blogger and doing it wrong and then feeling embarrassed and then finding out the secret to it then I, I do think there's sometimes a bit of a human nature thing to want to keep it to yourself and make it sound harder than it is because you don't because I think we all have this mindset some sometimes uh, apart from the really like the Dalai Lama maybe that it's you know (laughs) it's like this (laughs) he doesn't count (laughs) he's a higher being I think we often have this this scarcity mindset that we can fall into out of fear um, I, and I know I, I'm prone to it myself. So yeah, and I think in the blogging sphere, and essentially, which does sometimes feel quite competitive, like there are mm-hmm. a lot of bloggers out there. All, and sometimes it does feel like every, like everyone is kind of competing for the same things. Mm. There is such a like a key part of that. I think it's a very easy trap to fall into. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really great that you designed a course to kind of share your knowledge with everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I. I didn't expect that it would do as well as it did and I made lots of mistakes and um but it was all really really good learning um so then I realized when I'd because I'd dabbled with blog coaching in the past and I I actually didn't really get on very well with the kind of one-to-one model um Mm. and I don't think I was very good at it either and that's fine because I I tried it and Uh, I didn't, you know, mess anyone up too much, and (laughs) hopefully. Um, So then I I think the one-to-many option is definitely much more suited to me. Um, So so, uh, do you kind of see yourself transitioning from sort of journalism into more, like, entrepreneurship? And, like, do you see, like, courses being, like, a bigger part of, like, your future business? I don't think so and I have thought about that um but when I think about the things that I really really want out of life and the things I really Mm. enjoy doing journalism will always be the number one just because I love writing so much writing is always going to be my the the heart of everything I do I think um Mm. because even in writing the course the thing that I really enjoyed was really creating the content and translating seemingly complex things into really quite simple kind Mm. of you know simple things and as a participant of that course even though I haven't quite finished it yet you do do that really well like you really break stuff down into very and SEO is something that was completely above my head and still sort of is I'm sure that once I finish the course I won't feel the same way um but it's something that I've kind of always been like oh I don't care about that because I I just couldn't bring myself to actually do the work to kind of figure mm. it all out, if that makes sense. Yes, totally. Um, and yeah, you do. You really break stuff down into very like it, it makes it makes sense when I read your course. Oh, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So talking a bit more about journalism, because and I don't know when you're going to publish this, but today you have just launched your my first byline course. Yeah, your first byline. Just, your first, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, it could be your first by life. So. <laughs> it could, it could, it could be mine. Um, so first of all, congratulations. Thank That's you. That's very exciting. Um, and secondly, so first of all, starting with like your own experience, how did you get your first byline? Well, the <laughs> it's actually, it's a very funny story. So I um, had been writing for a long, long time and I was living 
abroad being a digital nomad and I when we came back because we talked about this on your podcast actually when I kind of came back and forth and um, for weddings and various bits and bobs and there was a three-week stint when we were back in London and I was temping for office angels um, and I got placed in um at immediate media just as, I was just re- being a re- receptionist um but I was kind of checking people in and out and calling people all day you know transferring calls and what have you and immediate media if you don't know is um a publishing house I don't know would they be called a publishing house? yeah yeah they are a publishing house aren't they yeah yeah I think so and they um basically own all of the BBC magazines um and and more so I've written for them in various guises, actually, for different publications. But amongst kind of top of the pop magazine, all of the BBC kind of magazines that you can imagine, mm. um, Radio Times, they also publish uh, Lonely Planet Traveller magazine. Ah, oh, yes. Very <laughs> handy. <laughs> and uh, on my last day, I basically called the editorial assistant. Or, yeah, I think I called her and said do you ever need interns or do you ever accept pitches kind of cold pitches and she was like just send me over your cv essentially and Mm -hmm. and I did um, and I sent her my blog and she called back immediately and was like yep okay great so if you want to um if you want to come in um for the next two weeks and so I did um and just got stuck in shadowing her and basically being an editorial assistant um and at the end of my two weeks I'd got my first byline which doesn't always happen but um I guess because I was a bit older maybe and um I had quite a bit of writing experience behind me although none of it was for anyone that I thought were made me worth anything so I mean it was the tiniest little byline, but it was in print and it was for something that I dreamed of. So I was just so chuffed. And that's where it all but began. It's, yeah, but it's a byline for Lonely Planet magazine, yes. which is amazing. Really, yeah. really good. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever been as proud. And I still, you know, like that's still on counts on my bylines. And I'll still quote that because I'm, I'm proud because it was you know I'm not the best writer that's ever lived and I'm not the most clever but um I believed in myself and I just and it was a bit of like tenacity I think really Mm -hmm. tenacity grabbing the opportunity making things happen for myself um and that's probably yeah I think that's probably why I'm so proud of that moment because it was all of those things culminated in one it wasn't just yes, I crafted a great pitch or, yeah, it fell into my lap because someone knew someone who knew someone. I could have easily left that two weeks stint of being a receptionist or actually I think it was like four or five days. I could have easily left there thinking, oh, yeah, well, you know, I know their details so maybe I'll call them. Mm. Um, And it's a bit of a, like, I hope it's inspiring to other people because, again people like to make you think that it's so hard to become a freelance writer and it's not (laughs) it really isn't (laughs) yeah again I think it is again one of those things that's kind of built up to be a lot harder than it is and I think your story is great in that sense and it because it just shows that you can do it um and it sounds like it's like the perfect story to you know, and the perfect like experience for you to then write a course from, because like you say, you didn't have like a leg up in any way. Yeah. And I suppose I don't want to say that, you know, I don't have any privilege. I definitely do in that I was able to take up this unpaid opportunity for two weeks. Um, because I could, I had, you know, I, you know, I, I can understand why. And I do think that it's a real shame that, there's this real intern culture in the arts that mean that basically it's our, you know, journalism is a bit whitewashed now because mm. who can afford to come out of a journalism degree, live in London and not be paid for six months? Well, people whose parents can afford to pay for them. And I think yeah. that's 
that's a real shame because what's being reflected back to us now in our in our media will ultimately end up just being middle class white people (laughs) but at the same time yeah I did I did seize opportunities when I could Mm, it's the same with book publishing which is Mm. which was sort of the area I went into straight after university I worked for free for six months as well um and book publishing is pretty much entirely white middle class and that's a real shame because I think that reflects in the books that's being in the books that are being published um and it's the same as it reflects in the contents being published in magazines as well because you don't have a diversity of writers or the gate if the gatekeepers aren't diverse then they're not going to be letting through a diverse um I mean I think they can let through a diverse I mean I you know I don't think every every gatekeeper purposefully doesn't let through diversity but I think that there's not that sort of natural flow um, that comes from that yeah and then in turn the people reading it aren't seeing people that look like themselves so therefore it feels even more of a um, mm. hurdle to get to it I, yeah and I think it's a real shame and it's very easy for me to say that as a sort of white <laughs> I'm ethnically ambiguous so but most people think you know I certainly from the outside just look like a white middle class girl so ah. so and how so coming how why did you decide to do the course then and how did you kind of find the process of creating it was it easier having done the SEO one yeah it was easier there was definitely more pressure because I thought I know all the areas that I went wrong in and i just pressure from myself really I just wanted it to be so much better um but it was it was easier and I did a course about launching courses which is kind of meta (laughs) (laughs) but it was such a brilliant course I can't even tell you um and can I ask what course it was yes yeah it's called um this is gonna this is a bit embarrassing because it sounds like I've totally ripped it off but it's called your first course no hang Uh, on yeah is it called your first your first course launch and it's so good it's it was really simple it was just brilliant and you know really I think it was really quite cheap um and so I thought well you know I need to you need to speculate to accumulate um I think Mm -hmm. it'd be worth it and I did it and oh my goodness the I mean it launched the course launched today and already it's done so much better than my previous course which I was blown away by um oh wow congratulations thank you and like just uh, when I say it's done better I don't just mean in sales but also in how smooth it's gone, how organised I felt, mm. um, I think how happy the students have felt, um, and I just feel a lot more confident about it. So I, if anybody is wanting to launch a course through Teachable, and actually hers isn't specific to Teachable, but um, she does talk about that quite a bit, I would definitely, definitely recommend doing her course. Um, but yeah, so that's how I kind of... The re- I mean, the reason I wanted to do the course was literally the same reason I wanted to, my kind of motivation for ev- everything really is to just be more, like, make things more honest and um, show people that it's not as hard and help other- help the people who I see as me five years ago. Mm. That's kind of my why. Yeah, like help people, like throw down a ladder to help people come up behind you, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You're so much more eloquent Um, than I am. (laughs) (laughs) That's all your copywriting. (laughs) It's it's also just as much easier. And this is is the trick about copywriting is it's so much easier to put into words what other people are trying to say. (laughs) (laughs) When I try to do it for myself, it's a lot harder. (laughs) Do you find, I have a question for you, actually. Do you find that with copywriting, because I see quite a lot of, and this might be a huge generalisation, but I, certainly in my field in journalism and in blogging, I see a lot of people transitioning into copywriting, and I'm putting it in inverted commas because Mm -hmm. I don't think people realise that there's actually a real skill to copywriting. It's not just writing copy there's a whole marketing element to it and there's so much more and there's branding and do you see quite a lot of people moving into your industry kind of misguidedly or um with misguided uh intent intent yeah um yeah I don't I don't know whether I keep 
I'm kind of very much like I do follow a lot of like other like creative people online and I'm very much part of that world but I don't know whether I have slight blinders on when it comes to other copywriters because I definitely don't there are certain people who I've got like a group of people who I'm of other copywriters who I now talk to like every other week um which is great because it's like a real like support um network I think that I think that it's a completely different skill to writing like content and writing copy. So writing like blog posts, writing long form and um, like writing a sh- like a copy is basically saying what you want to say as clearly as possible in as fewer words as possible. Um, and that is a real knack. Oh, my God. Yes. Brevity is like my nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> I could never be a copywriter, Fiona. I don't I. I bow down to you. I'm just no. But it's also, it's also. I don't think people understand that writing short takes a lot longer than writing yeah. long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I can bash out a, a a blog post, a thousand words in you know a couple of hours. But if I'm going to write the front page or um, a work with me page, like it takes a lot longer to do that um, to kind of get that like crispness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, totally. But I think for me the biggest thing has been sort of like figuring out my own process and kind of taking ownership of it a bit more. And I think that's also slightly kind of meant that I don't I don't know I no longer feel like a writer for hire, which is what I was doing for um like 18 months freelance basically. Like I was just kind of like people were telling me what they wanted and I was just doing it. Um but sort of kind of think of it more as a business um and like taking ownership of my own process and coming up with my own way of doing things. Um yeah, has made it all feel a lot better and I feel like that also kind of means that no one else is doing it the same way as I'm doing it, which means I am kind of I mean I'm very much in my own lane, I hope. Oh, I love that. I love that. Oh gosh, and now I've completely lost my time. Because <laughs> we're talking about the course. Um, because you also got some other people to do guest um, did, bits, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. So who have you got involved in that? So I've got my bestie. I've got Lauren Croft, L Croft, who um has just been on your podcast. Um, she has. There's a lot of links to go in the show notes, and I'm I'm terrible for saying. Uh, I'll link it in the show notes, and I never do. <laughs> oh, I did. I had that with Elle's episode. I like listened back to it, and I never make notes of what I should put no, in the show same, notes. And I was same, like, same, I know same. I said it at least twice. Oh god, um, it's terrible. I'm glad other podcasters don't do it as well. <laughs> you're not alone. You're not alone. So no. Lauren is writing a chapter all about the importance of editing, <clears throat> and um, I think people just don't realise how important editing is. And actually, it comes back to your point about um, writing shorter does take longer. And especially when you get... The, so the course, the way the course is structured is that it go, it really heavily focuses on the pitch because I think that is the biggest hurdle for most people is finding journalist details, knowing what to pitch, knowing you can pitch, knowing how to pitch. Um, and then... And then I also focus then on, you know, when you get your commission, what happens then? Because that's that is another hurdle. How much do you charge? How do you write a feature? <laughs> um, so editing, I think, is yeah, super important because sending something back to an editor that is three hundred words over the specified limit might not yeah. seem like a big deal, but it is. So. Yeah, so that will be an awesome chapter. And then Monica Stott, who is the travel hack, has written a, um, a lesson on typewriting. So Monica, the travel hack, says it in the name, um, did a degree in journalism and she was going to be a journalist. And then she did lo- and was a journalist and then um, became a super successful travel blogger. So she's got a really unique perspective because she is a blogger, but she also has a formal training in journalism, which I don't have actually. Um, but she's doing a lesson on typewriting, which I think will be awesome. Uh, and it's something that will be helpful regardless of whether you want to be a journalist or not. Um, and I've also got a lesson from Sarah Arnold, who another one of my friends, who is a freelance journalist. She's written for The Guardian, Independent. She's written for The Mail. She's written for loads and loads of people. And um, she also started out as a blogger. Um, she's a very newsy journalist. She's amazing at getting a good hook 
for a story um and she that's what she's writing her lesson on it's the art of smelling the hook smelling a good story um because that is something that I think is super super important yeah oh that sounds amazing Mm. um I just want to go back slightly to what you said about um your why was basically sort of it's being as honest as possible I think that's kind of what you're known for online um I think and you wrote a really great blog post recently about um your stats and sharing yeah. your stats because <laughs> there's so much um I don't know how to put this there's so much rounding up going mm-hmm. on <laughs> isn't there <laughs> I mean <laughs> we're getting a bit salty but <laughs> it- I, I mean, I think I think it needs to be said. And like I wrote yeah, a post recently about like how bloody hard the first few months of running a business are and how everyone makes it look so easy. Mm-hmm. But they're only doing that because they're selling you their products to help you get your business off, uh, to help you with your business. So yeah. it's just and I think it's yeah. So I think there is a lot of like timelines get shortened a lot and like mm-hmm. success gets kind of preempted. And there's a lot of that going on. Yes. Um, so yeah so how did it feel publishing that post I think it felt very vulnerable and there was definitely elements of me thinking so the background to it is that um I've always been pretty happy with my stats um and then I switched everything over to Squarespace and they dropped off a cliff really yeah like so I've never ha- I've never had huge monthly figures. I think my peak was probably about forty thousand a month. Um, Pretty and good I was though. Averaging at about thirty thousand, um, and then it dropped. It went from like thirty thousand to about five thousand. I was like, wow. "What? That's mental!" But there were a lot of problems with the move. Um, uh, the migration was. There was a, thousands of broken links, and I had stacks of AMP errors and loads and loads of things. It's still quite a lot of them haven't been fixed. And if you are migrating your domain, um, like switching from one domain to another and having to put in redirects, then or switching from one big platform like WordPress to another, um, like Squarespace or you know other hosting providers are available then you would expect to see a drop in stats and you would also expect to see a drop in um domain authority and that's just that's to be expected but for a short period of time so it so it dropped off a cliff but I was kind of like wow that's huge but hey hey I was kind of expecting that it's no drama um and then they just stayed they kind of crawled crawled back up um so this was maybe three months so, oh no it's actually ages ago now probably five months ago now so but for a good few months I just kept thinking oh maybe they'll go up maybe they'll go up I wasn't really doing anything about it I wasn't really fixing any errors I wasn't like trying to promote my blog but I just thought <clears throat> well they'll just go back because yeah. why wouldn't they <laughs> because I want them to <laughs> because I like the look of that number and I liked that <laughs> and then I, and then I thought this is ridiculous because the the point where I thought it was really, really ridiculous was when I really wanted to go back to WordPress and do the whole hoopla again just so that I could get my stats back up to where they were. And I and I didn't even question in myself why, why do I want that number? And I didn't someone asked for my media kit and I didn't want to give them my media kit because I hadn't updated it since my stats were at the level that I wanted them to be at so despite the fact that you know like my Instagram followers had increased by about a thousand uh, or despite the fact that my maybe my Pinterest engagement had gone up or whatever I don't even think that's a real thing but do you know what I mean like <laughs> despite all these great other actually tangible useful metrics going up or even that I could ask real people for testimonials um, to say, yes, I bought this product because Lucy recommended it. I was like, no, I don't want to give you a media kit. I don't want to update it because 
it would have to say 10,000 instead of 30,000, which essentially is complete bullshit. It's a vanity metric because what does that mean? It means nothing. To me, it means nothing because I don't, my money doesn't come from affiliate marketing. And even if it did, that doesn't, stats don't necessarily matter. But I got myself into a, a real negative headspace about it until I was speaking to Jane Carrington and 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 I said, I think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to publish my stats. And she was like, well, well, you know, Jen, like, <laughs> and she was like, well, I think, you know, your thing is honesty. So I guess you've kind of got to walk the walk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's it. You're right. Yeah. And I think that's people I found, it. it seemed to me that you had a really good response to it and people found it very refreshing. Yeah. Because um, I think it also kind of, says something is I think and I think you're right that like at the end of the day they don't really mean anything tangible like they're just numbers and I one of the things I always think about is that I know people who have amazing stats but who barely make rent every month mm. and I know people who have less than a thousand followers on Instagram whose businesses are really thriving yes yeah. so it doesn't it, you know they don't always like there's they're, they're not always a valid indicator of success um Oh, oh, success in whatever terms. And I'm not just saying success is financial either, but they're not always a valid indicator of that. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah, you've put it perfectly, I think. Um, and it always comes down to knowing your why and knowing um, knowing your goals as well. Like if when I realised that when I looked at my so I do a monthly profit and loss because I'm a geek <laughs> and when I realized when I looked at it and was like oh so I came back to work in January and I've earned I've earned already um double in January than I earned the month the year before um and yeah like probably throughout the year it won't necessarily be um I won't I'm not going to be you know publishing a post my income report to say hey I earned my first million this year <laughs> but <laughs> I'm earning enough money to support myself to support help support my family and to do nice things and I'm meeting my income goals and I am definitely stretching them because I want to earn a lot more so what mm-hmm. and I'm doing all of this without having you know without having the stats that I had before on my blog because the stats that matter are increasing and and that's I mean the pounds (laughs) are increasing basically (laughs) and that that are the stats that matter really to me and I don't want to be crude about it but I'm not in this for totally for the love of it like I do it because I love it of course but I do my job to earn money to pay for things that I really like doing which is travel <laughs> and eating <laughs> um no I'm exactly the same and I think that there's and I think that it's good to say that and to be honest about that and to be like yeah I do I do like you know I do run a business like this is this is this is you know this is something that's that needs to you know it needs to pay and yeah. you know I need to get a salary at the end of every month yeah um, yeah so I think I think that's really great to say Thank um you. So you've also recently moved to Brighton. You mentioned at the beginning that that was a big move. Yeah. And I think someone in your Facebook group asked me to ask you why you moved to Brighton and how you're finding it. Oh, yes, they did, didn't they? I forgot about that. I love mm-hmm. my Facebook group. You're so amazing, guys. <laughs> so do I. I love my <laughs> They're the sweet, aren't they the sweetest? I mean, you're in it. You're the sweetest. Like, I love them. I love them. Um, yes, so why did I move to Brighton? So I... Uh, me and my husband have wanted to move to Brighton for it's probably been in the works for about three four years and um we almost moved when we first came back from traveling and then it didn't work out and then we went traveling again (laughs) and um the stars kind of aligned um probably later last year when we just thought um my husband wasn't loving his job but he was getting promoted quite quickly so that was one of the main reasons that we stayed is because um the job that he was doing was based in London and um, but he could do it from everywhere because he's an estate agent so uh, I think we just got to the kind of end of our tether in our flat um, and my cousin had moved back to Brighton 
can we I don't know really like I'm a very decisive person I go 100% with my gut Mm. so I was like we've we've got to move that's it (laughs) we're doing it (laughs) (laughs) so we did (laughs) but I think I think when something feels right you just like there's no point questioning it because you're just like well this is it then that's what I'm doing I agree but you know when you know don't you or when you know you know or whatever it is yeah exactly and how have you found it so far Oh my God, I love it so much. <laughs> I was so nervous. So in the, so we sold our flat, um, or we accepted the offer on our flat February the 3rd. And then it took until April the 13th before we actually moved, which is a fairly smooth <laughs> sale. Um, but in that last month, well, you know what it's like when you're moving from, from somewhere that you suddenly see all the good things about it and you're like oh god how will I cope and you know I've been in London since I was 18 so that's a really long time I've I've grown up in London I consider in many ways I consider London to be in fact yeah in all the ways I consider consider London to be my, my hometown even though I'm not I'm from um the seaside um in Kent but so so yeah I was like oh my god like what am I going to do without I don't know the tube what am I going to do without my local and I have such a nice community blah 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 blah. I love how you were going to miss the tube. Yeah I know like how ridiculous is that <laughs> <laughs> of all the things to miss in London. <laughs> yeah just sitting on that hot sweaty tube just being like oh I'm really going to miss you. But you know what because I wasn't commuting I'm sure if I was commuting oh uh, yeah like, but it's just it's just rose into glasses, isn't it? But um, within about two weeks of living in Brighton, I just kept saying to myself, "Why didn't we do this sooner? Why didn't we do this sooner?" Because I've made more friends. I'm a gazillion percent more happy, and I have the seaside on my doorstep. We went we went there today actually, and um, me and my daughter. She was really grumpy. We went swimming. And then um, I'd made some sandwiches and I was like, oh, let's just go for a picnic on the beach. And we just had the best time. And I can't tell you how easy it is to practice gratitude <laughs> when you're living in a place that you love. So, yeah, I'm finding it amazing. <laughs> Good. So far. Good. Um, and one of the things that you said has sort of been the constant through everything, including like through your move to Brighton, is your podcast, this podcast. Um, so how, so what have kind of been like the highs and lows of it, especially since you last spoke to Sam Sparrow? Hmm. So the, the highs without, without question is the Facebook group. Um, yeah. I would say that's been just the most profound kind of joy and I can't even emphasize it enough like there's been times when I've just been weepy over how much I love my Facebook group (laughs) I just love them they're so brilliant and it's just yeah it's such a beautiful safe space and it's really supportive yeah it's really nice there's no snarkiness everybody but that's all you guys that's you know I I haven't I facilitate it but I it's all of you like you're amazing um uh, that's been the high 100% and Mm. and then second to that would just be getting to chat to people that I really love and I'm sure that you feel exactly the same way although we haven't really talked so much about podcasting but I'm you have a fairly similar style style to me and um I think getting to chat to people that you just really who really inspire you or Mm. you've got real chemistry with or you know whatever um and I I often use the word fangirl because I'm a huge fangirl (laughs) unapologetic fangirl and that's just been amazing and I said yeah sorry go on yeah I know I was just gonna say I mean I'm exactly the same it's given me like a reason to reach out to a lot of people Mm. um and I've I've always been quite shy online. Like I'm actually shyer online than I am in real life. Um, and I kind of follow silently or did follow silently a lot of people. Um, and it's been really nice to kind of actually have that like legitimate reason to reach out and then have them. I mean, I don't think anyone said no to me yet. Touch wood um, to be on it, which has been really, um, really lovely. So, yes, yeah, so I completely agree with that. 
Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? It's so, and that's a really. I never even thought of it like that. It ha- It is giving you a reason to reach out to somebody and start a conversation with people that, yeah, like I, I know that people sometimes say, just you know, tweet me and whatever. But sometimes it doesn't. You know, tweeting someone or retweeting them or sharing their blog post or DMing them on Instagram or whatever. It doesn't always. It's it's not the same. No, um, it's not. And getting to have an actual conversation with them. And you yeah. know what? I, it doesn't surprise me that people have never said no because people love talking about themselves. They do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I have to like tell myself every time I send off an email. I'm like, people love talking about themselves. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> That's um, and mantra. what about what about the lows? Oh, I think the lows, it's a lot of work. And although... Yeah. It doesn't have to be a lot of work. I think I don't like to whinge about it, but there's a there's a definite entitlement when it comes to how people see podcasters. So what I mean by that is that when you're leaving someone feedback, I think it's very easy to forget that that person has paid for their own equipment is probably sat in their bed with cushions surrounding them um so so that the sound is a bit better you know they've they've you know spent money on the podcast and they create they want it to be awesome and they've got these amazing people and having these awesome conversations and they're giving it to you for free Mm. um and I, I think that really comes down to the entitlement that we all have around free content and not having to pay for content full stop. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I think I don't think people quite understand sometimes the amount of work mm. that's involved in producing a podcast, especially when, you know, you're not getting paid for it. So I, you know, I we both, I think, edit our podcasts ourselves. We yeah. do all of the work ourselves. Yeah. Um, and I've spoken to a couple of people recently who are quite keen to start their own podcast. And whenever I say how much work I put into mine, they're always like, wow, why does it take that long? And I'm like, well, <laughs> and I like break it down for them. And like at the beginning, especially also at the beginning, it takes, yeah. it took a lot longer each episode. Like I have definitely got my time per episode down now. And I think it's probably about as tight as it can be. But I think I'm probably like, I don't know what your figure is, but probably like four or five hours an episode. My total? Mine's a bit, a little bit less, but you, okay. but you're, but that comes with time because when I was at the stage that you were at, um, I was the same. Like four or five hours an episode, I mean, that, that is not a long time, I don't think, for, podca- for podca- podcasting because it's not just, like you say, it's not just about the editing, you've got to upload it, you've got to write the show notes, you've got to optimise it for Apple Podcasts who only like things done in a certain way and, then, and we're not even taking into account the fact that we have to email people, schedule calls, have the calls, um, promote it on social media, yeah. answer questions, all of those sorts of things. I, it is, it's a lot. I don't even, I don't personally think that four or five hours is an, is a long amount of time for each episode because yeah there's a lot that goes into it no but, yeah I can totally understand why people would be surprised at that and um, yeah you're right we don't get paid for that um some people it's do half, of course. it's half a day's of it's half a day's work essentially yeah, yeah. um which yeah which, and you know which I absolutely love doing and it does have a real reason for me yeah but you're right there is that sort of thing that like people I don't know it's like one of the things that people just kind of like come out that people think just kind of come out fully formed like mm. oh you just record the interview and then Half an hour later, it's up on, um, it's you know, it's up online, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, um, totally. yeah, no, <laughs> no, not so much. <laughs> but that's definitely been a real low for me, um, because I'm, I, I, although I probably appear very confident, <laughs> I'm like I. I'm sensitive, so and I take I do take it personally because what she said is my baby. I like before my baby, <laughs> it was there before my baby. My first episodes were recorded when I was pregnant. I oh. came up with the idea and started recording things. To yeah, how old is she now? Thirteen months, so almost two years ago, over two years ago. 
Um, and it was a long time kind of coming because I just didn't have the confidence to put it out there. And I think it's also quite hard in our, I don't know, it'd be interesting to talk to you about this because we're in like the same sphere Mm. or kind of genre. So I was speaking to, I interviewed, no, Lola Hode interviewed me for her podcast, One Girl Band, and I'm going to have her on my podcast. And obviously you're going to be on my podcast. I've been on yours. I really like the kind of cross pollination of podcasting. I Mm. think it's really nice that if we work together within our remit I think it's a really good thing because you doing well doesn't mean that I'm doing worse and vice versa in fact the more the better I do or the better you do I personally think the better we both do the only reason it can shift and I'm not going to say like there's definitely been times that I just feel do you remember in um one of the weekly threads that I did in the Facebook group and I was like oh guys I'm feeling so jealous and actually I'm feeling super jealous about Fiona but I'm owning this <laughs> and I, I, I won't I give it any it, power <laughs> but I felt it as well definitely like there's some yeah, people who you've normal, interviewed who it? oh you've had a really good conversation and I'm like oh that was such a good you know and you yeah. do and you do feel it but I think your point about like lift each other up like practically I think of it like both like theoretically and kind of like it works as well but I think on a practical level I do notice that when someone else has like a surge of popularity their episode of my podcast does well so yeah we'll so even on like yeah, that sort of point. like super yeah. practical basis like I think even when you publish that I remember your episode had a bit of a spike recently and I can't think what you had done at the time but I just remember noticing that it had that like it had there'd been it had had more downloads basically how interesting that's really funny yeah but yeah yeah so just on that level I think it really does work and not to mention the whole you know like lifting each other up you know on that level as well I think yeah so that I think that's probably been a high and a low because I sometimes feel that uh other people well, not even other people. I, I think I think it's very easy to slip into what scarcity mindset again, isn't it? It's very easy to slip into comparison mm. and scarcity and feel that what we're doing isn't good enough. And the reason that that's true is because someone else is doing better, but that's not true. Um, and I've I've had really positive. Um, wins when I've reached out to people within I I mean I would love to have all the other podcasters in our section on my podcast and I would really love it if we just had a girl gang of UK business podcasters yes I would love that I would absolutely love that that's such a good idea I really want someone to I really want someone to facilitate it I don't I feel like I feel too nervous (laughs) I mean, I feel I would it. feel a bit nervous as well. I we could do it together. Yeah, we maybe we'll combine do forces together. and do it together. <laughs> yeah, let's. Um, Actually, we should talk about that. Let's do that. We really should. We, <laughs> let's like put a pin in that. That's a really good idea. I like <laughs> but um, I mean, how how much more could we achieve if we were all in it together? Yeah, so I completely. I yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I think that no one just listens to one podcast. No, like, not at all. That's the thing is I think that, you know, and I think that there's like a, like, I think if you can build it up as a web, then people just naturally flow totally all of the podcasts and that's great. Yeah. Um, so Jen Lowthrop, is that how I say her last name? Lowthrop. Lowthrop, sorry. Mm, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> um, wanted me to ask you, which do you prefer, blogging or podcasting? <gasps> Ooh, that's a good question. What do I prefer? Mm, Oh my God, that's really hard. (laughs) Uh, So, mm, I love writing. I love, love, love writing. And I really love the catharsis of writing, creating something and putting it out there. Um, And perhaps reading it back another time. And I love the kind of evergreen aspect of blogging. Um, podcasting I found to be amazing for conversation Um, I I don't have a lot of commenters on on my blog so um, 
if I get six, I'm like, wow, viral. <laughs> so like, but but with my podcast, it's constant feedback and and the type of feedback as well. I will often get um, emails or DMs or you know people saying sending me kind of long messages of. I really love this because, and I, I really loved you introducing me to this guest. And it's not, it's nothing to do with me really, because it will be, you know, the guest has had an effect on them or our conversation or whatever. But I, yeah, I really love that. And I think I really love the collaboration part of it in a way, because I'm, I'm much more comfortable, even though I'm a total one girl band and a total kind of, solopreneur (laughs) um I love working with other women yeah (laughs) no I yeah I completely agree I like that side of podcasting as well I like that it's kind of putting you in front of real people and having actual conversations with them and it's it is and it's refreshing when so much of both of our work is done on our own on our laptops you know headphones in it's it's I think it's really I find it really refreshing yeah I agree yeah 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 I didn't even think Um, about it like that that kind of yeah having those human conversations about blogging or whatever yeah it's awesome yeah and the and the getting emails from people I mean I have the same thing and I I get far more emails I mean I mean most people who email me mention my podcast at some point now Mm. and I think it's because there's that real sense of like you get much more of a sense of who you are as a person yeah and I think it's more intimate isn't it it is and I think people feel like they can then email you because it doesn't feel they feel like they know you a lot better I think and they do having you know having listened to having listened to you I think I think so yeah it's definitely uh, so I used to, in an old job that I did, they used to always talk about raising your profile. You need to raise your profile to get promoted. And it's definitely done that in terms of um, it's really easy to get lost in a sea of people doing seemingly similar things to you, but you're the only one that can do you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like you say, people get to know you better. I'm, I'm, 100% myself on the podcast there's no airs or graces I waffle and I'm not eloquent and I swear a lot and I think <laughs> people it either turns people off completely or people go yeah I like her <laughs> I like <Yeah>. her style <laughs> I started when I first started I edited things a lot tighter than I do now like I've kind of learned to embrace like the imperfections and like natural rhythm of speech if that makes sense yeah totally. more now because I think at the beginning I was like every time there was a pause I was like oh I've got to cut that out I've got to cut that out but now I kind of just let it and when I do waffle or my guest waffles I just kind of think well we're having a conversation so that's what people do yeah (laughs) yeah I'm the same yeah um so Monica Stott who you mentioned earlier asked me to ask you how you are juggling your work with parenting (laughs) <laughs> I'm not <laughs> okay basically honest, I'm not <laughs> honest answer as expected <laughs> um I wrote a post about this actually the other day um yeah. and I'll obviously link that in the show notes <laughs> um yeah I'm gonna be checking back over yeah 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 check the show notes and see when you have actually written all of these things in them <laughs> good keep me accountable um yeah I'm not really juggling I I don't believe in the juggle I don't believe I mean the juggle is real like you have to do it um but I don't believe in ever worrying about it because for me I've I know that she if I want to work then I can't work around her naps she just has to go to nursery (laughs) so and actually I need her to go to nursery a couple of days a week for my insanity and I don't really feel guilty about saying that um no, of course not but I think I can totally understand why people do feel guilty because just that's just as soon as you have a baby you feel you start to feel guilty about everything <laughs> every day <laughs> that's just yeah that's it but um yeah I don't juggle it very well but I do I know my limits I think I'm just super honest with myself now which I never used to be about um 
in the early days of kind of motherhood, I wasn't always honest with myself about what I could physically do and also what I wanted to do. So I don't really, I don't enjoy working around her naps. And I did that a lot at the beginning. It really stresses me out. And I also, I'm just stressy with her. I then get annoyed if she's wanting my attention. So instead, I'm very all or nothing. I'm either 100% with her or I'm 100% working. And that's why I just made the decision that when I'm working, she goes to the nursery. And that's that. Um, and yeah, it's not a very good but answer. <laughs> no, it sounds, it, to be honest, it sounds like the smartest way forward. Like that sounds to me absolutely perfect. I think there is this kind of myth of like the baby sleeping in the basket next to the mother who's typing away at her laptop like that it can that that can happen and I can completely understand that it, that's just not realistic I think um, for some people it definitely is and certainly in the first couple of months I mean so many of my podcast episodes were recorded with her just with I was breastfeeding her while I was doing a, an interview um uh, the, yeah, you can hear her gurgling in the background a lot, and it's quite cute actually. <laughs> but, I'll have to go and listen back to some. Yeah, I do. I mean, probably absolutely horrendous sound quality, but it's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, but I think there, and for some people it does work, and that's cool. But you just have to find your own limits. You really do have to find your own limits, and my limit is definitely just work and no baby or baby and no work <laughs> basically <laughs> which yeah which makes complete sense definitely <laughs> um Lucy I think that's all I've got like I think that's uh that's all the questions that I had they were awesome um, questions thank you so much for your time I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It. it was an honor. Like I was literally like any excuse to talk to you, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> the feelings mutual. You asked me, and I was like, "Oh, I get to have a conversation with her." Sure. <laughs> Shall I tell everyone where I where they can find me online? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't know how you wanted to end. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, yeah, do you want me to ask you that? So, Lucy, where can people find you online? <laughs> Um, I'm LucyLeeCraft.com or LucyLeeCraft on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook. Um, but you can mostly find me on Instagram. <laughs> Thanks for listening to what she said. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, please think about leaving me a five-star rating and a review if you have time. This really helps other people find the podcast and means that Apple don't hide me in their vaults. If you fancy joining my small but perfectly formed bunch of podcast fans for chit chat on Facebook, head to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash what she said podcast and come and join us. Can I just say Brighton has been so good for your Instagram? It's... It looks amazing. <laughs> my grid is looking so good since I moved. <laughs>